All right, welcome back. Always pleased to bring you exciting, new, and unique programs here in the area. And the other day we had Councilman Carly Harding. He was on the program telling us about one of those. It was called Unity in the Community. Try to bring police and law enforcement to the community to better relations. And Unity in the Community was held Saturday, May 14th at Eagle Wright Baptist Church. It was a joint effort by Terrebonne and Lafouche Parishes to raise awareness and promote prevention, encourage community engagement, and foster meaningful partnerships. It was presented by multiple organizations, included were the Homa Police Department, Lafouche Parish Government, Lafouche Parish Sheriff's Office, Terrebonne and Lafouche Parish Lawyers, Terrebonne Parish City Marshal, Terrebonne Parish Consolidated Government, Terrebonne Parish District Attorney's Office, Terrebonne Parish School District, Terrebonne Parish Sheriff's Office, Thibodeau City Marshal, Thibodeau Police Department, and the Terrebonne Parish Consolidated Government Juvenile Detention Center. We now show you some of that event as it took place on Saturday, May 14th. A cordial good afternoon to all of you as you come to reverence in the house of God. I reverence God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I greet Pastor Lewis Clark with agape and love, and then we welcome officials from both the parishes of Terrebonne and Lafouche to our community unity meeting. Our meeting will begin with a word from the Lord found in the book of Romans, chapter number 13, and I will read to you verse number one. That verse reads, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. The word of God shared from Romans chapter 13, verse number one. At this moment, we're going to ask that Pastor Clark will lead us in prayer. Pastor Clark. Head bowed. Our Father and our God, it is again that we humble ourselves before thee. We gather in this divine setting. We gather in this political setting. We gather in this citizen setting. But our heads are bowed, but our hearts are lifted. Our eyes are closed so that we can seek divine direction. Now bless our coming together that it may serve as we go forward to help bring about a change for many of the things that is perplexing us today. Bless every presenter that they may share with us their ideas. Bless this pastor who have opened his doors for us and bless the citizenry who has an interest and a concern because your word has declared that together we will stand but divided we will fall. So now use this in the power of your spirit to guide and direct and govern whatever it is that we attempt to do and at all time it is ours to give your name the praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We shall now be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Stephen Ponville. Mr. Ponville will come. God bless you as you're seated. We will now have our unity song of praise led by Sister D. Satcher. Let's stand. Okay, we're all gonna sing together. I guess I'll start it. God bless America, land that I love. 
Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the ocean, wide with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the ocean wide with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. From the mountains to the prairies to the ocean wide with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Thank you. At this moment, I present to you our councilman, Brother Carl Lee Harding. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Irvin Brown, great pastor of the Eagle Wright Baptist Church here in Gray, Louisiana, giving honor to also a uh, great pastor of the Mount Olive Baptist Church, Pastor Lewis Clark. It's two things when I wake up in the morning that I come to realize. My eyes pop open, I realize that there is a God. Number two, I'm not him. It's only by his grace that brought all of us saved us for. And his grace will lead us on. I hold a position, and I hear the term politics sometime, and I just happen to be a concerned citizen that have a passion for the people. I look at the fact that I'm more Christian than when I am politician, because I was on drugs uh, since I was baptized uh, at the age of four. My mother drugged me to church and she still tried to drag me to every church that she goes to. <laughs> but we look at trying to bridge the gap and bringing communities together. And before I really get off into it to try to create a particular mindset for people, I would like for Chief Coleman to stand up. Chief Coleman is the Polish chief in Turban Parish in the city of Homer. Chief Coleman, when he was appointed to be chief of the Homer Police Department, the community had great praise for him, proud of him. And I happened to be in a setting because I have the sentiments of Chief Coleman. Because most oftentimes, a man can only look at himself unless he looks him, look at him in the mirror. And people that look at that man can only assume things. 
when he shows up as the young man that grew up on the east side of town, it's praise. But when he shows up as a man that has a job to do, he looked at differently in his own community. I say to you, keep doing what you're doing. You came up in the police department after I come through the fire department, and it wasn't easy because there are obstacles and hurdles that you have. But in order to bridge the gap of the community and law enforcement, the mindset does not look at him for who he, are, he, who he is. Sheriff Tim, could you stand, please? I met Sheriff Tim on the east side of town, him and his wife and I think a daughter. A little back street and we both were seeking a position, which we now hold. It's no different between these men when they come to do a job. They shouldn't look any different by any part of this community. So the the, the professionalism that is exemplified in this country by law enforcement and the court system throughout this land, I do believe that over 90% of the time, these gentlemen do not let, yeah, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, law enforcement do not let their personalities prejudice their position. The position I hold, I should not prejudice my position with my personality. So I'm not going to let my personality prejudice my position, and no one in this room should do so. As the community look at law enforcement, and through history, they looked at law enforcement negatively. Pastor Brown read the scripture in reference to uh, the authorities and invading the authorities. I was a lady who said, well, the police keep pick picking on me. I said, well, what's the problem, man? Uh, they keep telling me how to move my car. I said, why are they telling you to move the car? They said that there's a sign where I park my car at that says no parking. It's the obvious. Some asked me, I said, well, why do you go hang out on the corner with the fellas. Well, that's the heartbeat and the everyday people that I serve that may have to have the understanding that law enforcement do not mean them no harm. So uh, you have the police come in by my house. I said, no, your lifestyle have the police come in by your house. Prior to uh, obtaining the position People came to me and said, well, you're going to go downtown and get those people straight down there. And I said, no, nah, that's wrong. I said, I'm going to get my community straight. What about the dead bodies? What about the mothers and the daughters and the sons and the grandchildren, and those people that are affected by crime in our community and in some aspects that when Certain people seem as if that they are going to intimidate our communities and we give in to the intimidation. Why do I hang on the corner? Well, perhaps the police officers could be more visible. The guy told me I was at the barber shop and he was incarcerated. We're not, he was not able to attend here. And I said, man, you seem to be, uh, seem as if that you have it all together. So what would be the most important thing that you think that police officers and law enforcement can do to improve the community. I said, be more visible. I tried to be as visible as I possibly could. Some of my colleagues are uh, visible as possibly could. They could. So what we're going to do with, uh, I am Baptist, so we won't have that holding spirit. We're going to ask that um, Church Tim Sonia, Serge, Sheriff Craig Weber, 
Chief Dana Coleman and Chief Brian Zerang. Uh, so, well, well, we'll go with those. And what we're trying to do here is, is they're going to tell you what they do, and they're here to say what they need from the community. And we're going to have an opportunity after each particular segment, for, segment to have a few questions to those individuals specifically about what your concerns is. We want to bridge the gap in our community because I just can't stand to be intimidated in my own community when my mother has to walk the streets and other kids have to walk the street and we won't open our mouths. We won't take back our communities. We would rather put down law enforcement and the system. Of course, we wonder about why does a bar of soap cost almost four dollars when you get locked up? Or why does a phone call cost so much after you put your loved one uh, in prison or in jail? There are some things that create more hardship while someone is locked up in jail on their families and themselves. And I'm, after, I, after I finish this last story, we're going to have these guys come up and, and say, if you think a person goes to jail that's rather innocent, there are some aspects in reference to mental health, uh, lack of jobs, lack of education. There are a number of things when a person goes to jail, if he don't have no support from the outside, he comes out in debt. And that debt, because in the jail, they have people that actually help to protect people or give them. And when they get out of jail, they didn't have a jail, they ha uh, when they get out of jail, they didn't have a job when they went to jail. He just made a contact, a contact in the jail, but he got a different job when he get out there. You have to be mindful of what we're doing and how we're doing it, so we have to have a better way of doing things because that actually creates hardship on some of the people that were there. So uh, without further ado, um, this, this gentleman would come up, and, and after that, we're going to go through the judicial system. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, I usually make the joke when I take a podium, everybody thought I was taller. So we're going to get that out of the way now so, to, so we can, the short jokes, right, we'll get out of the way. But uh, look, I can say for the last two years since I've been in office, we've actually had, a, we've obviously had a lot of challenges. But the majority of the crimes we've been able to solve has been a help from the community. The community often helps and sometimes parts of the community they're a little leery about helping but the the challenge that we have is to reach out they have trust in us so we can uh help solve a lot of crime there's a lot of i i couldn't even begin to tell you how many where the community actually reaches out and gives us information and assists in the crime so if you think sometimes not saying nothing i'm just not going to say nothing um, if you think well they'll figure it out anyway 90% of our crimes that we solve is usually help from the community. So I want to let you know that when you're often passing information to us, it does help. We want, and I can probably say, and I, and I can't speak for the sheriff, but I can tell you I'm probably, he's probably going to say the same thing. We want a peaceful community. We love our communities, and Carly's right. We're here because God put us here. And all we're doing is serving what God wants us to do. And we'll continue to do that. Um, things that we've, uh, to kind of get ahead of crime, we do rely on a lot of technology. We've invested in technology. One, to bring transparency to my office, which I hold. I have body cameras. My officers wear body cameras. Now, on that note, I've had to arrest three of my own officers. They're not above the law. But the body cameras do two things. If my officers are doing right, and it gives you the facts of what happened. And there's been plenty of times where families come to my office and they say, well, um, he, they say this happened, that happened. Well, you can sit down and here's the body camera footage and this is what really happened. So we do offer transparency and I have, and family members have come in and I'm happy to show them. 
and I always said, you got one side of the story, the other side, but somewhere in the middle is the truth. And that's what we seek when it comes to when we investigate the, the crimes that we're dealing with every single day. Um, so with that being said, technology has been very instrumental with the teams I've put together in, uh, basically an intel unit. The intel units, we're monitoring social media, we're monitoring things where there's potential violent acts that we see coming and we can enhance, enhance law enforcement presence in those areas and to prevent. And I, you know, several, probably during football season, we got intel there was gonna be, a, there was gonna be um, a retaliation of shootings. And I can talk about it. So we did, we enhanced uh, presence in that area. We took three firearms from juveniles and had no doubt we stopped a retaliation which was related to gang and violent activities. The thing is, the younger generation, I'd rather get them before they make a mistake that's gonna change the life of another victim because there's always gonna be two victims on when, you, when a young man makes a, a violent act or a young lady conducts a violent act. The act on the victim itself, where they, they take someone's life, that family loses that loved one. But the generations that's making these decisions, that younger generation, well, they forget the, the action they take, their families also are victims, because now they have to see them incarcerated and see these type of things. And I just spoke to a mother on the way here. I don't think there's any father or parent wish their child would lose their life or be locked up for a long time. I think that's any parent's nightmare. So we have to be compassionate on, their side, on both sides, but more importantly, try to break through some of the younger generation and prevent them before they make these, these mistakes that's going to change their life, change their families, and the victims' lives and their parents. So we're doing everything we possibly can and continue to push forward, especially doing a lot of preventive things and preventive actions. Uh, we've increased patrol. Um, when I took office, we had eight. We're, we're pushing about 12 per shift now, and we're looking to grow a little more. I got on my budget to hire 15 more officers this year to come. I, we do want a more of a presence, but more of a presence of the community and that we're out there and reaching out to the community. I feel it's our job to reach out to you and just take our hand and work with us and we're trying to clean up all of our communities and make that effort among all of us. We're all in this, in this together. As the good chief down there said, one hand washes the other. And that's truth. So we rely on you to help us. And when it comes to agencies working together, I will say in this area, there is no better communication among state police, our, 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 our adjacent parish when it comes to solving crimes we work with Lafouche all the time we work with state and more importantly within our our um our parish with um parish with with homo police department 90 percent of our crime is it's a com combination that we're able to solve we're all working together and it's important that we work together but at the same time we're here reaching out to you to help us because we need your help and the only way we're going to do this to solve these issues is that we work together Mr. Carley, I really appreciate you inviting me. And I'm gonna let Craig Weber, he's probably a little more eloquent speaker than I am, he's been here longer. But, it, but it's all good. But you see a man's heart and I stand here in front of you, we're asking for help and we can't do it alone. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and thank you for participating. I certainly want to acknowledge and recognize Pastor Brown and Pastor Clark, as well as Councilman Harding for inviting all of us here to engage in what I consider to be important dialogue. I've also asked several members of my staff to join us as well. Seated in the third row to your uh, left is the commander of our criminal division, Major Josh Champagne. Seated next to him is Captain Carla Beck, who runs our reentry programs for our Lafouche Parish Correctional Center, and she's joined by someone she cares deeply about, Captain Mike Beck, her husband, who is the Patrol Division Commander, 
And of course, uh, Lieutenant Rodney Morrison has one of the most critical positions in the dialogue that we're about to engage in. He's in charge of our juvenile division section. And I say it's a dialogue because I like to hear, and I want my staff to hear from you as well as you hear from us, because Tim's right. Sometimes in the conversation, there are things that come to us that we recognize that we maybe could do better or we need to address. And similarly, there are things that we can share with the community that can help all of us work together much better. Just a brief summary of what we're seeing in Lafouche Parish, and I have no doubt Terrebonne and surrounding parishes are seeing similar things in terms of law enforcement involvement. First and foremost is this economy and this inflation has created a situation where people with addiction and maybe people without addiction are stealing a lot more. We've seen a recent uptick in thefts of property, thefts of precious metals, thefts of catalytic converters. And while that certainly doesn't necessarily result in a homicide or a serious violent crime, it is a community concern if you're the victim. Uh, you want that crime addressed and addressed as best as we can. And you also want to address the underlying root causes that caused or contributed to someone making that decision. Just yesterday, we responded to an overdose death. That's another thing that we've seen a great uptick in. And for every overdose death that we respond to, we probably revive 10 people with Narcan who, but for the involvement of a first responder, a deputy, a fireman, an EMT, an emergency room, probably would have died as well. The social isolation created by two and a half years of COVID-19, the impact of Hurricane Ida that many people are still trying to recover from and have been displaced, in my opinion, has exasperated this problem of people turning to illegal narcotics and oftentimes taking things that they don't recognize will take their life. So that's another community problem that we've had. With respect to the violent crime, in the 30 years that I've been sheriff, I'm sad to see that what appears to have changed and what makes the investigation and sometimes the prevention of violent crime is what I call the old mafia mentality of people wanting to handle things within themselves rather than working with the authorities to try to solve problems. And you add to that the effects of social media and the ability for a person or a group of people in Thibodeau to post a video that is offensive or disrespectful to someone in Homa or Bayou Blue or one of our other communities, and that escalates to a point of violent homicide type crime. We finally, with the cooperation of Homa and Terrebonne, were able to make an arrest in one incident back around Christmas time where there were five, five retaliatory shooting incidents between two people. One group would go to Raceland and they'd shoot, do a drive-by. That Raceland group would come to Bayou Blue or Homa and in one day there were three retaliatory shootings. Any one of us, myself included, can be the victim of a random act of violence. You can be going to the grocery store or find yourself pumping gas, whatever the case may be. You could be hit by a stray bullet or someone just really trying to take your property. That can happen and that's hard to prevent because it's random. But the violence that we're addressing and working towards trying to address, the person who is being shot at knows who is shooting at them. They know who they have an incident with. And with respect to community involvement, I think first we have to all agree that that behavior is destructive and we cannot condone that behavior. And we have to be willing to share information if it's in a confidential manner, using the Crime Stoppers hotline, or a one-on-one -on -one manner, or in some way to give us the tools that we can use to be more effective and prevent not only the person who's involved in these retaliatory shootings, but also the innocent victims who might get hit by a stray bullet along the way. Our region is blessed because we all operate in the same law enforcement computer database to share information. That's pretty much unprecedented across the country. 
So Tim and his guys and, and Dana and the chief of police in Lockport and Thibodeau and Golden Meadow and the sheriff's office, we all have the same information that we can share. So we know what's going on back and forth. That's an application of technology. Now technology has assisted us in many ways in being more effective. Digital evidence is what we refer to. Everything from phones to cameras to um, looking at tele uh, traffic lights, all of these things that we call digital media have truly advanced our ability to be more effective in crime fighting. And that's an advantage that we have, but it also creates a learning curve where we have to continue to educate our officers from within. For example, we had our first crime where the victim was scammed using Bitcoin. This whole cryptocurrency is a whole new area for law enforcement to gain competency in because it's where crime is leading. Not all criminals are uneducated, some are highly educated. Uh, I'm glad that, that Congress, I mean Representative or Councilman Harding brought out the fact that corrections is a big piece and that's why Captain Carla Beck is here and I will, will applaud Tim for a sheriff that was recently elected and is in his second year. He recognizes, he gets the fact that we have a unique role as people in law enforcement. Most people look at the sheriff and they think of deputies, police officers, investigating crimes, detectives. They forget that the sheriff operates the jail and the jail is occupied generally by people from our community who have been charged with a crime and convicted of a crime. And we know that we're dealing with a, a population of people that maybe disregarded the law for one reason or another. And they're under our care, custody, control, and supervision. So we have a unique opportunity to intervene in a meaningful way to try to change that. And, and Tim is unique. There are many sheriffs who don't recognize the value of the incarceration piece of his job. Um, he is embracing reentry. He is embracing restorative justice. He's embracing justice reinvestment and recognizing and, and partnering with us in many different initiatives to try to improve the outcome. Because if we can change a person's disposition, their attitude, their, their, their deficiencies, whether their needs or risk, and bring them back in the community in a more productive way, then we have improved our community in a very, very dramatic uh, manner. So that's a, a critical piece. And I'm gonna, I hate to always preach in a church because I'm not a preacher, but I was uh, in church before Easter and, and the sermon, the gospel sermon had to do with a well-known passage from the gospel wherein the, Jesus is in the temple teaching and the Pharisees and the high priests bring in a woman who has been caught in adultery. And as they walk in, Jesus kneels down and he's riding into the dirt. And they of course confront him and they said, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery under the law of Moses. Moses, she is to be stoned to death. And what do you say? And he gets up from writing and makes the statement that you often hear, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Then he kneels down and starts writing again. And the priest went deeper into that. He went deeper into that story. And of course, Jesus ultimately says, no one has condemned you, neither do I go forward and sin no more. But he said, the consensus, while there's no written record of what Jesus was writing at that time. The consensus among many biblical scholars and theologians is that Jesus was actually writing the sins of the accusers in the, stand, in, in the sand. So I say to, to you, all of you, and to our community, and to Tim, um, we, we, don't, we believe in second chances. We believe that we have that opportunity when people are incarcerated to improve the outcome. And if there's one thing that m means a lot to me, and I can tell Tim as well, is that we're working very, very hard behind the scenes. You don't necessarily see that, but we're working behind the scenes on the back end of the process as well as the front end of the process. So we're here to, to listen and to answer and to be part of the solution of improving the community that we live in. We're blessed because as a community, statistically, we're a lot safer. We're a lot better off than many other regions of the state and the country. But just being better off doesn't mean we can't be better. And I guess the last thing I'll close with, and Tim made that as well, is we have to be willing to look at the entire picture. We can, get, we can react to a situation. We can have a, a instantaneous, maybe guttural reaction to a video or an allegation, whether it's against a person or a police officer. But at some point, we have to sit back and say, okay, this looks really bad. 
it looks like somebody should be held accountable. But we also have to say, where is that accountability piece? And, and get the entire picture before we immediately demand some action that may not be the right action. So with that, I, I don't want to take too much time. There are a lot of speakers here. But I do appreciate this opportunity. And I look forward to the productive dialogue that will come from this. I'm one that don't usually take a podium. I like to be out walking around, talking and engaging with people. But I may start off here and I may end up down the aisle. But first of all, I want to thank Councilman Harding for having us here today. Um, I think this uh, dialogue is very important. I'm not going to stand here and you know just repeat the same things that were being said by our honorable sheriffs here. But um, one thing I do respect is the uh, analogy that you gave earlier when you asked me to stand and that hit home. So I want to elaborate on that a little bit because it is very important that we as a community, regardless of what we look like, come together because there's a lot of violence that's going on within our communities. One thing that I can say is um, when I was appointed police chief, just like Councilman Hardin said, I can go into the area where I grew up, which is Mechanicville, and a door can be closed in my face. But I can show up outside of that uniform and be welcome. But on the flip side, I can go into a restaurant, not in the uniform, and also be ridiculed. But when I'm in a restaurant with my uniform on, I can be welcome. And one would ask, well, what is he talking about? Well, we all know about the uh, incident that occurred with um, George Floyd. Um, when that occurred, I took a position on HTV and shared some sentiments about that occurrence. Um, when all of that division was going on, I find myself with my family in a restaurant, sitting down, trying to partake in dinner, and um, already had the little buzzer. Family comes in after me. And when my buzzer went off, a young lady and her family sitting there, she was like, uh, she told a little waitress, she said, the only reason that you're giving them preferential treatment is because of what's going on. Um, she used a few choice words um, concerning of my skin color. My kids wanted to get involved with her, and I had to show some restraint. But I took my seat, took my seat involved in dinner. But one thing that got to me was when this was being said, I saw a reaction of a young lady that was sitting next to this family. And she was like, oh my God, oh my God. Well, that young lady came up to me at my dinner table and she said, Chief Coleman, I am so sorry that you had to endure this type of, uh, this type of behavior. And this lady don't even know who you are. I said, don't worry about that. She just you know, showed her true colors. Well, she went back to this young lady and told her who I was. She then came back and tried to apologize, but I wasn't having any part of it. I was professional. Um, I didn't want to have anything to say to her. Um, but I crossed that bridge. And I always talk about a crossroad. And just like Councilman Harding said, I go into my neighborhood, Mechanicville, where my mom still lives. I cut her grass every week. I uh, do chores around the house. Sometimes you may catch me jogging in the neighborhood. People may pass by and say, what's up, Dana? But when something happens in that neighborhood and I show up in my black SUV with my brass on, with my uniform looking spit shine, <laughs> then there's another undertone. It's heartbreaking that as the police chief, I've been the police chief for seven years. I've been on the department for 29 years. I used to be the chief of detectives, worked several serious cases, was a part of the serial killer and everything. But the thing that's heartbreaking to me is 85 to 90 percent of the violent cases that I've had my hands in and that I've had my department hands in 
the victims and the suspects look like me. Many days I leave scenes, I go to my house, I share my sorrows with my family, and I ask them, what can I do? Because it appears to me that I'm not doing enough. Some people come to me and complain about activity in their neighborhood. I get with my personnel, we do operations plans, we go into those neighborhoods, and my motto is to be proactive but professional. We go into those neighborhoods, and we proactive. When we're in those neighborhoods proactive, some people come back and say, well, y'all dealt with the wrong kid. Lil Johnny is an honor roll student. Uh, he's on, uh, or he's on heart medicine or anything like this, but y'all jacking up the wrong person. Well, at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, why Lil Johnny not in the house? That's in my neighborhood where I grew up. Now I'm going to flip it to another neighborhood of some individuals that don't look like me. We got speeders in the neighborhood. They run in the stop sign all day, every day. Y'all not doing enough patrol. We turn up the heat. Guess who we stop? The same person that came in and made the complaint about speeders. <laughs> in law enforcement, we be transparent. You make the complaints, we're going to handle them. But we need help from the community as well. There is a phrase that I use, one hand wash the other. But I'm going to elaborate a little bigger. This hand is your law enforcement. This hand is those working with law enforcement. The face is characterized as the community. So in order for us to take care of our community, we bring our hands together, one hand, wash the other, and it takes two to wash the face so we can take care of our community. We can't do this by ourselves, you all. We cannot. It takes one hand reaching across the table and meeting you in the middle. It also takes us meeting at that crossroad, not to get into an accident, not an accident of differences where we're arguing and we're fussing, but let's come up with a solution. I've attended several of these town halls. I've attended several meetings. But when we have homicides with young black men as laid out on the street and young black men going to prison, I see no one meeting with the family of that victim. No one outside of the uniform that I wear meeting with the family of that victim. No one outside of the uniform that I wear meeting with those that are going to prison. Because a lot of those retaliatory cases that the sheriffs talked about is because no one is trying to meet in the middle to bring these families together to try to rectify what caused this friction. So one thing that I'm going to challenge each and every one of you in here today is to extend your hand across the table to work with your law enforcement not against them, and let's change what we're facing on a daily basis. I thank you once again, Councilman Harding, for having me. Um, I have an open door policy at the police department. You can come in at any time, but I can just tell you, since I became police chief, everybody that called over that said they my family. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, and my secretary tries her best to, to sift through all of that. but. Um, if you need a number to get in touch with me directly, it's 985-873-6383. My secretary's name is Donna Wedgeworth. And once you go through her, you can come directly to me. And by all means, don't tell her you're my family, because she's going to ask me. <laughs> so thank you all for having me here. And um, like I say again, let's reach our hands across the table. Let's meet at the crossroad. And instead of us getting into an accident, Let's try to see what we can do to rectify these issues that we're facing on the street every day with our young individuals. Thank you. Thank you.
throughout the state, um, Sheriff Weber has uh, one of the best reentry programs going. Uh, we spoke with uh, Sheriff Tim, a man of God, uh, doing a great job. Sometimes we talk seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, Chief Coleman, we try to work on efforts how to de deter crime. I talked to some people, said, well, we don't have no planes, we don't have no boats, how we do this and how we do that. I think also we have to look at the prevention part of it. Um, the state police, I was in a meeting on uh, Thursday, and the state police are not, were not able to, to be here, but they, they are important too. And the smuggling that's going on back and forth, back and forth. But from the east side of town all the way to Thibodeau, they've been wreaking havoc amongst themselves for no reason. And we want to go to the point, the next point right here with uh, the justice system. And hopefully um, uh, Mr. Fitch is not here, uh, but uh, Mr. Cook is here. We have a representative uh, from uh, the district attorney's office, uh, Joe Waits. I think uh, Gary, did he show? Yeah, is Gary here? Uh, he said he was on his way. Okay. But we want to deal with the uh, arrest, the bail, bail, bond reductions, and the court appointed uh, lawyers. And uh, in your presentation, hopefully we can cover that because uh, I had a, um, a guy uh, was uh, in, arrested. And uh, like Chief Coleman said, I'm only... I'm only a councilman. They, they called me for bond reduction. They want to talk to the, the lawyer, and they want to talk to the judge, and they basically wanted the trial just drop. You know what I mean? But then realistically, when you get your neighborhood and you go on the corner and say snitches get stitches, I tell you what, you do something wrong around me, I'm not going to jail for nobody else. I'm going to tell who did it. Because there's a little lady that's on, on my block. She said, you need to call the police. You need to call the police. But I said, well, if I call the police and then you bring them to your house, they don't want it to your house. They don't, they don't want the police coming in. That, that's a problem that they're having. So the police, you have to get a better system of how to actually go out and investigate sometime. Because this person be perfectly willing to, to, to call the police, but you go directly to that person's house. And those people that guns is walk, with guns that's walking up and down the street, they know who called the police on them. So that's part of the thing they have to deal with. If you don't mind, we'll entertain three questions before we get to Mr. Cook. Three questions to either one of these three men, men that just spoke. Questions. Mr. Rainey. Why are we cutting so many programs off for the youth? Why are we cutting so many programs for the youth? Yes, we're we dealing with an issue right now with summer camp. In the needy areas that this parish government and this parish recreation director just say Gibson. I'm going to use Gibson. If Gibson kids want to go to Buy Your Black swimming pool for to go on a field trip, that, that parish recreation director say he will not reimburse that district for that summer camp for them going off of the premises to go to that. Both they want to go to the capital. Well, both they want to go and learn things. Both they want to go to the Superdome. Well, why are we cutting off so many programs? When Michelle Claude was the, was the parish president, this summer that's coming up when these kids get out of school, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, all the recreation centers was open. Time on the weekend. So we cut too many programs off for the youth. We got to give them something to do instead of locking them up. So entertaining the questions in reference to recreational time and how law enforcement can actually enhance or better the, the situation uh, with certain programs. Well, the, the, the concept of recreation is, is above, I'm, I'm good, is above the law enforcement that's actually 
parish government topic that, I mean, I, I looked on here to see if any representatives from our parish government was here, but I don't have the answer for you for uh No, what I'm saying, I'm just saying, like you're saying, for the needy kids. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the problems we're going to have. The summer finna come, and they're not going to have nothing to do. Correct. So they're going to be busting your windows, breaking in your houses, doing stuff they ain't got no business. You know, we got to give them something to keep them active. You know, we, we got to give them an avenue, you know, to do things so they can look forward to not going to prison. You know, once they go to juvenile detention center, oh, y'all going to have 1,300 programs for them. But we don't want them to get there. We want to stop them getting there. Correct. Correct. You see? And the other thing, you go to speed. I live right here on 316. During the bus time for the schools, oh, they're going around the bus. Going around the bus. I call the state trooper office. I said, hey, trooper. I said, man, I got a problem with the bus, with the speeders going round the buses, round the buses. I said, can you come here by Eagle Wright Church and set them in, a, in the parking lot? I said, I'll get Mr. Cool to open the gate for you. You can sit there. He tell me, he said, Mr. Rain, he said, I don't have state troopers to go sit around and do that. Okay? Now I'm going through the tunnel. I stop on Tunnel and Valley. Come from behind the brick. Ten state troopers. Get out of 50 feet, get out of seat. Okay. Yeah, and like um, the, um, it's a community effort that we have here. In every aspect, even with my position, um, we have uh, other uh, council people here and other elected officials is the fact that it's a combination of things. Uh, originally, we first had an opportunity, and this is stemming off the, the other uh, town hall we had, because I, I spoke with uh, people in reference to crime and how these gentlemen here are going to uh, help out with crime. But then that's an uh, issue that we have to, as a whole, the first place I went to was the church. Uh, and then now we will law enforcement after we come to government. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a member of the church. My name is Darrell Woods. I have an adopted son. He's five years old. And I'm the one brought it up to Anthony. What is he going to do this summer? You know, a lot of things that start young. That's why a lot of crimes be happening. If you give them something to do, they'll get out of that, you know. That's what I like. Yeah, so in reference to recreation, we have summer camps. I think um, we have a juvenile section over here. We have um, a very, very important part of our uh, segment here. Mr. Joe uh, Harris will be uh, speaking with us. Yes, sir, you have one, one more question. None? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, uh, well, thank you guys. Again, you're like Chief Coleman, um, everyone here have contact numbers. If you really uh, look at it, they have an opportunity for, for participation. Um, uh, Sheriff Tim, um, tell us the program that you have uh, for, uh, for the youth that you have. Yeah. I have a junior deputies program that's that starts right after January. It's hunters education, uh, safety, where they go to the rifle range usually on the weekends. But I can tell you, it's not a program where the, we encourage. This ain't just a parent to dump your child off. This is an opportunity to spend quality time with your child. And uh, and we do that. We sign up. You sign up in January. And they actually go to compete in wildlife, ID, hunter's education. They learn how to shoot a bow. They learn how to shoot a shotgun. But basically, sportsmen is a sportsman's paradise. And we encourage, we encourage things like that. And they compete. If y'all didn't realize, Louisiana, we, in Terrebonne, we like national champions like eight years in a row. 
But it's all, uh, it's all, but I can tell you, it's the parents' involvement which makes the program. And we foster that. We're sponsoring this year, in, in June, I think it is. I got to look at my calendar. The, the state champions we're holding in Terrebonne is going to be the second year. We used to leave out of the parish and go to central Louisiana. Now they got a taste of south Louisiana in Terrebonne, and everybody wants to come, come to our parish on what we're doing. And we do it at the range. And y'all more than welcome to see when the competition goes on just to see the children go out there and they get to compete among one another. But it's all good fun. But I can tell you right now, everywhere you see a child, you see the parent with them. And it's an opportunity to spend quality time with their children. Thank you, guys, and uh, taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, we we'll have Mr. Cook right now, a representative uh, all, uh, from the Lafourche Parish City Marshal, a representative from um, the District Attorney's Office, um, Mr. Gary Williams. Uh, one more thing, uh, Mr. Cook. Uh, I was talking to Mr. Frank Kidd. We have computer classes that are being taken away from Terrebonne, H.L. Bourgeois, and uh, other areas that uh, we have a lack of participation. So what we spend quality time, like the, uh, the sheriff said, spend quality time with your children. Don't let the game watch your children. Uh, Mr. Cook. Good afternoon. First of all, obedience to God. Secondly, to uh, Pastor Brown and Pastor Clark and also officers and members of the Eagle Right Baptist Church. Uh, I am Marshal Calvin Cooks. I'm the elected marshal uh, in Thibodeau. And uh, before becoming marshal, uh, I was a Thibodeau police officer. I retired in 2020 as a captain. And I can tell you, I I've worked closely with Chief Dana Coleman on many, many cases. Uh, he was chief of detectives at one time, and I was chief of detectives in Thibodeau. And we'd call each other back and forth if he had an incident in Homer. Uh, he called me sometime. It was wee hours of the morning. I answered the phone and vice versa. And uh, we always worked together. And I still have that same relationship with Chief Coleman, uh, Sheriff Tim Swanier, uh, Sheriff Craig Weber, and any other local uh, law enforcement agency, state, federal, uh, and local uh, in this area. But I can tell you, uh, in 1990, I started my career in 1990 as a Lafouche Parish Sheriff's Deputy. And in 91, uh, I transitioned over to the Thibodeau Police Department. And in 1997, I became the supervisor for, uh, some people say the housing projects, but I always call it public housing. And at that time when I got that job, I was tasked with uh, drug activity, frequent shootings, um, resisting the officer, fighting the police. They had pay phones at that time, at the time table on Tiger Drive. The youngsters, at 11 o'clock at night would call 911 and lure Thibodeau police inside the housing projects and they had bricks in the ditch and they start breaking the windows on the police cars. So that's the job I was tasked with. And when I got that job, I started making a difference immediately. But I can tell you, I always tell people, it's hard to be a good police officer, it's harder to be a good African-American police officer. So from my job duties in public housing and arresting people and those arrests caused families to be evicted because parents was not uh, watching their children and the children was committing a crime. So everybody had to go. Well, I'm a member of the Moses Baptist Church in Thibodeau. And uh, my pastor is Reverend Lloyd Jones, Jr. And he always tell everybody, shake your neighbor hand. I went to shake this lady's hand. She looked at me. Not me. You better get away from me. <laughs> she was upset with me. I see them in the grocery store. They mad at me. You know, so I can echo what Chief Coleman has said about being a good police officer, but who I am and who I have to police and who's, who was committing uh, the majority of the crime who I had to deal with in public housing, 85%, you know, people who look like me. And the same parents would get upset with me. I can tell you, in 1981, I was 11 years old. My brother and I stole some bikes. My mama called the police <laughs> and had us arrested. And I caught a whipping. I never forgot that. If my mama wouldn't have done that, where would I be today? Would I be here? 
I thank my mama today for what she did. And I tell all parents, be a parent, not your child's friend. Okay? If you see your child got brand new shoes, or he got a, a, a brand new watch, you know you didn't buy that. You need to investigate to find out where he got the money to get it. But no, some of the kids paying some bills for mom and daddy. So, you know, they kind of look the other way. That's a problem, you know? And listen, people get mad at me. They've gotten mad at me before, but I don't bite my tongue. Wrong is wrong is right is right, you know? We need to start governing our children. Amen. And that's where it starts at. It starts at toddlers. Working criminal, uh, working uh, uh, public housing, uh, I dealt with parents every day. I got, you got three year olds, they making them cuss you. Sh show them the middle finger. Say F you. So I tell them, what's going to happen when this child go to school? What you think they're going to do to the teacher? I, you got children telling teachers, my mama going to get you. You better not mess with me. I'm going to call my mama for you. I know. I drove school bus for over 20 years. So I dealt with children on that side. So, you know, listen, we got to come together as parents and stop protecting our children. That's where it starts at. We got to get on top of this. The Thibodeau City Marshal's Office will always work with the law enforcement agencies. Lafourche Parish Sheriff's Office is the chief law enforcement agency in Lafourche Parish. Thibodeau Police Department is the chief law enforcement agency in the city. Okay? People call me all the time. Calvin, uh, listen, uh, so-and-so is uh, causing a problem on St. Charles Street. You need to call Thibodeau Police Department. Okay? If you call Thibodeau Police and you want somebody evicted, they're going to tell you to call the Thibodeau City Marshal's Office. So we don't overstep our boundaries. We're trying to work with all law enforcement agencies in the area. The Marshal's Office, we are tasked with protecting city court. If city court issues an order, whether it's a warrant, we're going to come and look for you. If they issue a subpoena for you to come to court, we're going to come serve you with a subpoena. If you borrowed some money from the finance company and you didn't pay, we're going to come serve you uh, with some paperwork. You know, you're being sued. You know. Uh, if, 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 you didn't, if you didn't pay for your car and, and they got a repossession on your car, we come and look for the car. That's what we do on the civil side. On the criminal matter, okay, the marshal office does have uh, criminal enforcement responsibilities. If I have a deputy marshal that's uh, in the neighborhood that's issued a subpoena to someone and you get a car that blows through a stop sign, that deputy marshal is going to stop you. He's equipped with uh, traffic citations and criminal summonses. If, if he's going to use discretion, but if he thinks you need to get a ticket, he's going to write you a ticket. If you got a warrant for your arrest, he may take you into custody. Okay? But I can tell you, since I took office last year, we're not looking to put people in jail. One of my commitments was to alleviate a lot of the warrants for people's arrest, a lot of misdemeanor warrants. We got something now through the Thibodeau City Marshal's Office called a 211 summons. In other words, if you have a warrant for your arrest, and we advertise it on Facebook. If you got a warrant for your arrest, call the marshal's office. We're going to give you a new court date. We're going to write you a criminal summons, 211 summons, with a new court date, and that's going to recall your warrant. It can't get any better than that. You know, we're we looking to help people. You know, that's what we do. And, and, but we need you all's help. We can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. You know, if I go into a lot of the neighborhoods that I grew up in, if I go down Eagle Drive and I ask a kid, uh, you want to be a police officer? They tell you no. No, they don't want because they are taught that we are bad. We not good people. And listen, I'm not going to tell you that you don't have some bad apples out there, but as administrators, we do our best to get rid of the bad apples. And if you see something, a police officer doing something not supposed to be doing, give us a call. We're not going to look the other way. We are proud of our agencies, and we want you to be proud of us. You know, uh, I, Mr. Rain talked about uh, programs for children. I've been doing Angola trips for children uh, for many, many years now. We offer that to Lafourche Parish students. Uh, if you have, a, and listen, it's not just students that have issues in school. It's anybody, that you can have uh, straight A's. If, if your parents call me and we, can, we got an opening, we're gonna put you on the list. We take this trip to Angola and we talk to inmates. Mostly one of them was uh, somebody that had been there since he was like 16 years old. He had been in there for 25 years. He made a mistake. We're trying to teach them to make the right choices. It's always make the right choice. You know, I made a bad choice. Everybody make a mistake, but my parents taught me you were wrong, and we're not going to uphold you. You know, so we need that same cooperation 
from everybody in this room. And we need you to go out and tell your neighbors, you know, what, what we talked about and what we need y'all to do. Without you all, you know, we cannot be successful. So uh, in closing, uh, Mr. Harding, I, I really, really appreciate you uh, asking us to come down. When I was leaving, my wife said, well, where are you going? I said, I'm going to uh, Eagle Wright Baptist Church to a meeting in Terrebonne Parish. In Terrebonne, you don't have any jurisdiction over there. I said, I know, but I said, Sheriff Weber and a lot of other administrators are going to be there, too. It's, it's a regional thing that they're calling everybody in, you know, because crime just not, it just don't stay in Homer. It's going to cross over the line to Thibodeau. It may go to Assumption, and it may make the circle and come back all around, you know. But when you got agencies that's cooperating with each other and they're using the same information, then guess what? You know, we, we can stop the crime. Uh, when I took over last year for the first time in the history of the Thibodeau City Marshal's Office, which has been operating since 1955, we own the same law enforcement system with the Sheriff's Office, Thibodeau Police, and every other agency in Lafourche Parish. You know, uh, I see Lieutenant Morrison over there. I just spoke to him two days ago. A parent called me about a child. It wasn't even in my area, but, you know, she may not know Lieutenant Morrison, but we have a good working relationship. So. Uh, I called, he called me, matter of fact, because he heard I, I was trying to get in contact with him. Worked that out, he resolved the issue. You know, so sometimes, you know, you may not know uh, the person that's in charge of certain areas, but you may know somebody else that you feel comfortable with talking to. And, and you know what? We accept that. When people call our office wanting to talk about an issue, we take the information, then we pass it on to where it needs to go. You know, so. Uh, in closing, I, I thank you, and we really appreciate it. And if y'all need something from the Thibodeau City Marshal's Office, you can contact me or my secretary. My secretary is Ms. Gretchen Cayouette. Uh The number is 985-446-7264. And also, I have an open-door policy. And my secretary, she, she makes fun of me. She said, because why give my number out, Calvin? Because she said, everybody got your cell phone number. My cell phone number is 985 637-0813. If you need me, call me. Thank you. Um, before um, 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 Gary comes, Mr. Cook, what are your office hours? My office hours is 8 to 4.30. Do you work on weekends? I'm, I'm 24 hours. My office hours is 8 to 4.30, but I'm 24 hours. That's oh. why I get to myself. Uh -huh. Okay, but then see that's that's that might be a part of the problem on the visibility with these with the the people and the rest. Um, I walk the street a lot. Some of the people that got warrants, you won't find them. <laughs> Not until your office closed or on the weekend. Well, I mean, but listen, listen, the 211 service, it's not just the marshal office. The sheriff's office, mm -hmm. the PD, they offer the same service. Every agency offers that. But what I'm asking, and nothing, nothing to offend you, but I'm just saying how to make it better. If you want some of these criminals off the street, they know you're not going to be there at 430. You're not going to send nobody looking for them at 430, after 430. Then they hit the streets. On the weekend, then they hit the streets. Right. So the system... Um, what we're trying to say here now is the fact that if you have a violent criminal that's out there and you know and you want to clear up the system, trust me, you have to work hand in hand with law enforcement. And, and listen, and this is why I give my cell phone number out because a lot of people uh, have relayed to me that I call a dispatcher, they ask me all types of personal questions, who are you, what's this and that. So listen, I say call me, call me. And I'll relate it to the dispatcher, but I'm not going to tell them where I got it from, but we're going to get the job done. You know, and, and I understand a lot of people are, are scared about retaliation in their neighborhood, neighborhoods. You know, so that's why I try to work closely with them and give them my number. You know, you can come by my house, everybody know where I live at, you know, I got that open door policy. Mm. And I've been like that for years, and that's why I've been able to solve so much crime, you know. But we have to work together, and, and we do that, you know. And listen, it's not, I can't do it by myself. I need everybody in this room, and I need to have a good working relationship with other law enforcement agencies, which we do have that. I can call anybody in this room at law enforcement, also back right there with the sheriff's office, got their cell phone numbers, and we're going to get it done. What's your number? 
oddly enough, also, uh, I lost my cell phone. I'll get it uh, somewhere down the line. And that was a situation uh, where one of my uh, constituents called me. And oftentimes they call me when something happened in the neighborhood to try to um, subdue some things without uh, uh, anything going any further. And I go out there, and the lady is saying, well, why are we calling the police? I said, well, we have somebody that's injured out here. So well, we don't want the police around here in our business and this, that, and other snitches get s stitches. Two weeks later, she didn't want the police involved, but then two weeks later, her son gets shot. She didn't want the police to be involved. She called me. She said, well, what are we going to do about this? We need to find this person. We need to find that person. And it goes back to what we said. Sometimes, you know me, the shiny cars and all the money and your bills being paid is not worth your child going to jail for the rest of his life or you going to the funeral home. It's not worth it. Uh, I mean, Pastor Brown was talking about in part of his scriptures with that a man don't work, he, he don't want to eat. And my stepfather said, and he don't live in my house. Simple. Um, Gary, thank you for waiting. <laughs> hey, how everybody doing? Uh, most of you know me as Lil Gary, but I am Gary Williams Jr. I work for the DA's office. I've been a prosecutor for six years. And right now I handle mainly felony prosecutions in Judge Ellender's courtroom. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Harding for putting on this program. And uh, I'll be quick. Uh, it's, it's different now, uh, even from when I was younger. It's, Two things I wanted to touch on, social media. Social media plays a big part with uh, a lot of our criminal cases and just with the youth. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but they're all on Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, and they're all on social media. Sometimes I can figure out a case just by getting on social media. That's how prevalent and that's how much uh, the youth are on it. So just be mindful of that. Uh, you know, if you got young kids, monitor that because, man, they're they doing all kinds of stuff on social media. Um, also, it's uh, working in, Sheriff Weber will tell you, working in the public, it's, uh, you know, a lot of communities get stigmas, and, uh, you know, they say don't go to this area, don't do that, but dealing with the public, we deal with everybody. I deal with white, I deal with black, I deal with uh, Hispanic, gay, straight, so we deal with everybody. Uh, it's not a... It's not a black people problem. It's not a white people problem. It's a terrible and parish problem. Uh, we got a lot of crime, and uh, y'all see it. And uh, it's probably because it's, you know, uh, social media and uh, it's, everything's in the paper now. Somebody does something, it's going up in 10 minutes, thanks to Dan Cop. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, it's, as a community, it's, uh, we're dealing with some weird times right now. And I know I sound like an older guy saying I'm only 32, but it's different from when I was growing up. So um, just be mindful of that. Uh, I wanted to give you all a story. Recently, and I'm, I was at a Pelicans game, uh, but I got a call from a sheriff's deputy. Young guy just started. And I'm going to show you how, how we interact with each other. He was dealing with a situation where uh, it was a guy who just said my name. Uh, that I grew up with. Now this guy had just got out of jail for serving 12 years in jail for, for selling drugs. So they, they already knew who he was, they knew what kind of guy he was, but they were dealing with a dispute. So the guy mentioned my name and luckily that deputy called me. Uh, I think if that deputy called me, my friend would probably be in jail. Uh, but he called me and he kind of gave me the background of what was going on. And so uh, I said, well, look, I said, give me 10 minutes. I said, I'll call you back. I said, don't, don't do anything yet. Um, I called my friend, he's irate. I said, well, look, you about to go to jail. He cursing me out, he cursing, the police still there, the deputy. He's cursing the deputy out. 
I said, hey, man, you better chill out because you're going to jail. You might go to jail. I said, so I talked to my friend, uh, and I talked to the officer. The officer didn't have to do this. Uh, I, I can't tell him how to do his job, but um, he talked to me. He said, well, tell me about this guy. I said, well, I'm going to tell you. I grew up with him. I said, uh, we were, we're the same age. I said, yeah, he made some mistakes. I, I see why he's upset. But I said, I don't think you need to arrest him. I said, I think you can do this and this and this. I said, look, he's not a bad guy. He just, he's just in a bad situation right now. Luckily, that guy didn't go to jail that day. The deputy listened to me. He didn't have to at all. And I told the deputy, if that was me and the guy was getting out of with me, I probably would have arrested him. But he called me. He had, he had the intelligence and just, he just thought about it. He said, well, let me ask him. He, this guy's a district attorney, and I want to see what's, what's going on with his friends. So I told him we, the situation went from being at a 10 to about a 2. Everything's, fig everything's figured out. Uh, and look, usually we don't get that. Uh, I hate to say this, but at the district attorney's office, when it gets to me, it's too late. Usually the crime has already happened, and our, uh, you know, the deed's been done. Uh, when it gets to me, I got to figure out what to do with the person. So uh, I'm last resort. And I always tell it to families and I always tell it to people, look, I'm last resort. When it gets to me, the person's either been arrested or a summons has been wrote. Uh, Mr. Harden, I know you wanted me to touch on a few things. We don't want to get the public to think that we just actually just saying, look, we law enforcement, this is what we want to do, beat this down your head, this, that, and the other, because uh, even though this place should be uh, filled with people that are concerned, uh, just recently a guy was telling me about how people feel as if that they go to jail for small, minor offenses. Uh, they can't make bail. Uh, they sat in jail for maybe a year, a little over a year. Uh, they can't get a bond reduction. They can't get out of jail. They this, that, and the other. And finally, when they go to court, they could have been out of court, uh, out of jail six months later. Uh, they have situations where people um, may um, have been arrested and a family member goes down because someone within the house was foul. And sometimes they can get caught up in circumstances when they're losing their jobs only by association. And we want to protect the citizens cause, because oftentimes when our siblings are doing wrong, sometimes we can't deter them. Yeah. And and there are instances with the district attorney's office and how you, you handle the cases where you might hold somebody down. And I know some instances where, you know what I mean, people that got professional positions and their family members put them in jeopardy. Where a nurse can lose a job or, or uh, someone else that have a civil service job can lose their job because they are associated co-signing and stuff like that. Uh, could you touch base on some, some of that? That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in reference to you know, people staying in jail, um, right now we make a, an effort to not keep anybody as long as they should be. Uh, usually, unless it's a serious offense, uh, we try to give them a reasonable bond to make, uh, but you know sometimes you get some of the serious crimes and uh, you, you, you kind of don't want that person out on the streets. Uh, now with people just sitting, uh, I saw this firsthand for the hurricane. Uh, you know, we didn't even have a jail, and we had to ship people from all across North Louisiana and to different areas. It wasn't anything we could do. We tried our best, but uh, you know, I always tell people this too: the criminal justice system it doesn't move fast. It's really slow. And if anybody has ever been part of a even civil civil case uh, or a criminal case, it takes forever. Uh, it's it's just the way it goes. Um, 
I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yes, it does. But any anyone want to entertain uh, a question to in reference to district district attorney's office? Because a lot of times people say, well, "Look, call the district attorney." This is your opportunity, people. Yeah, I would like to know. Uh, I had a sixteen-year-old had never been in trouble before. Mm -hmm. Well, I he didn't have prevention to stop him from getting into trouble. So he left home one morning and he went to Grand Coyote in the trailer area over there. And he had a gun and a, and a, I don't know what you call it, a little pack of weed. I don't know what you call it. But he had that. And he got caught. Yep. And that first offense. And when he was turning 17, he was in Hunt's Correctional Center. I think they should, for first offense, they should try to prevent these children from going to penitentiary, put them in something that they can do, a boot camp or something, because I figure once you go to penitentiary, you are exposed to all activities. Yeah. Generally, on a first offense, uh, if, it's, if it's not anything too violent, we try, you usually can give probation. We try to give somebody, or we even offer them, we call it pre PTI or uh, pretrial diversion. We try to get them away from court. Uh, but sometimes, uh, if, if it's serious enough, you know, they can be charged as adults and they can be, sub they can be subject to some, some heavy jail. But I'm, I say this, for the six years, majority of what we deal with is, I'll say, 65 to 75 percent is just ordinary people that's making some really dumb decisions. Now you got you got your your worst of the worst who's doing some cruel stuff, but that's what we're dealing with a lot. Uh, and I can tell you that's our goal at the DA's office. We'd like to give people second, sometimes third chances if we can. Yeah. Now I don't know what happened with him because that's rare. Yeah. Okay. But good, I wasn't there, so you can't blame me. So. <laughs> any any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you mix the good with the bad in the jail? Like, oh, no, British thing, and, and people that gonna be there a long time. Because uh, when they go to jail, they might some harm might come to good people. You know, like they don't put doogie up in the church and you know, you know, you know all that jail. Huh? Uh, that's sure, Tim. Well, anything when you look at that. At, at crimes and when they're incarcerated, we'd go through classifications. So they are classified on how they're placed. Um, yeah, just out of clarification, when people go are incarcerated, there are one of two categories of incarceration. People get arrested but have not been to trial and not been convicted. People that are presumed innocent. Those are people that we call pre-trial. They have not been through the system. They are all classified. It's very complicated. A jail is a very complicated place, like an emergency room. Because you can't tell who's getting arrested, what crime they're getting arrested for, and what their background is. Just like you don't know somebody's coming into the room with a heart attack or a, a hook in their finger. So you might get an 80-year-old person with diabetes and heart trouble and dementia who committed sex crimes.
Yeah. Um, please bring the message back because most people that may be affected by a program like this, you won't find them in here. You find them when you leave out and go and, and pass them up tonight. Now, we're getting to one of the most important parts of this program. I'm going to have Mr. Joe Harris come up and tell the story. Then I'm going to have Miss Carolyn McNair come tell the story about our children. About our children. Thank you. is, is we're trying to correct the behavior, not necessarily the individual, but correct the behavior to put that individual on a better path. Juvenile detention, well, what constitutes as a juvenile? Juvenile is from 10 to 17 years of age. 10 to 17 years of age. 10 years old. 17. Back to when you said your son got in trouble, man. If he would have been seventh, if he would have been in this time now, he would be considered as a juvenile. The laws have just changed. Before it was up to 16. Now it includes 17 years of age that they are considered juvenile. So he would have come to a facility known as juvenile detention. In juvenile detention. I would like to call myself, I am providing a service to the community. I am a, really in essence, I am a program. A program to help kids understand and to get better. Um, one of the things that we try to do and, and make note of is that individuals coming to us, we're trying to make them better if we receive them for them to go back to the community to be better individuals, to be more productive. And when I say that, one of the things that we do in juvenile detention is number one, we have a behavior modification program. Behavior, behavior modification means we're trying to, again, adjust the behavior. What they used to do, we're not going to accept that. If you do do it, there are consequences for your actions. We make that understood up front. Number two is, there is no option whether you go to school or not go to school, you're going to school. We have a school on premises. We can accommodate you to be able to get your GED, get your Carnegie Union, and also you can take your high set. Also, if you're a graduate, we can also sign you up for classes at Fletcher on you. So we're giving you the tools and opportunities to be better. That's what we want to do as individuals working with our juvenile. Everyone may see that as, well, yeah, that's a jail. Yes, it is a jail. It's called custody care and control. And the reason why we're here is to protect the kids and protect the community. And the third part is just to make 
make sure that kid is available for court to go see the judge. So he or she would not get in any more trouble. That's what we provide as a service again to the community. Um, as I heard Mr. Calvin and um, Dana speak, you know, most of the kids that's in detention look like me. I had 388 kids that I took into the facility. 243 of those kids look like me. That's 80 percent of our kids coming to the facility that day. Also, with that programming, most of the kids that come in, guess what they are? Born. All 80 percent of those are young men that could potentially end up in the adult system. And those, that's what we're trying to avoid. We're taking that into mind, again, having programming available to these kids. Um, we have a thriving daily schedule that goes from in the morning to at night. One of the other things that we do, we have a life skills program that we have for these kids, a life skill program that teaches them how to go through our application, how to dress, how to talk. We also teach them you know what? If you want a job, maybe sit in service. We teach them how to paint. We teach them uh, how to guard. We teach them a little. We teach them, we even teach them etiquette, how to sit at the table, how to conduct yourself. In your mind, you ask, you want to have a decision? Why is that? Some of us take for granted how our parents raised us and assume everyone else is, everyone else knows. All the kids we see is not always their fault. Some of them are coming from some destitute background. And when I say that, could you imagine a kid every day in the household, parents telling them, you ain't gonna never be nothing, you ain't gonna never grow up to be nothing, you're gonna be just like your daddy, Look at you now. I don't know why you're around me. Get away from me. You're already being talked to naked. But the hope is for them. But yet still, I want to say this. They come to juvenile detention in jail. Supposed to be, supposed to be negative in connotation. But when we come to them, when, when they come to us, they get clean sheets, clean clothes. They get shoes on their feet. It's safe. It's secure. We feed them wholesome meals. They ain't got to fight for it. They ain't got to pay for it. They ain't got to steal it. We're being positive with them, telling them they're all going to be something. You can do this. You can do that. You can achieve this. You can be a fireman. You can be a police. You can be a doctor. <coughs> We're being positive with them. Juvenile detention. That's what y'all do. Yes, that's what we do. Why? No. This, this is the one thing. Please don't get this concept messed up. We're not a babysitting service. <laughs> we are holding them accountable for their actions, and we should or should be doing as parents. So we, essentially, we, we become the parents. We become the uncle. We become the grandma. We become everything, we become the <coughs> home. We become everything. And my dialogue with you may be a little bit different than everyone else. I want to give you a background first so you have a clear understanding of what we're doing. So when someone comes to you and say this about this and that about juvenile detention, you say, oh no, Mr. Harris himself said this is exactly what it is. As always, when you talk about transparency, we want to always be transparent. We want you to know what's going on with your kid. We want you to be able to talk to them. Just the other day, I was on a phone conference. We were talking about shipping juveniles out of the state to Mississippi. Can we do that? But if you don't have a 
juvenile detention within your region, you may have to do that. So the, the other component is that we're fortunate, not, 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 not a connotation as being negative, we are fortunate to have a juvenile detention center within our own parish providing the services to our community kids, our own kids. And the reason why I say that, because if a kid has a program or has to go to a counseling service, we are able to take them ourselves. Or if he needs to have a phone call, talk to his parent, or they need to visit, they're able to get to the juvenile center, detention center right down the street. But if a kid is shipped off to Mississippi, how can you feel them? How can you touch them? How do you know what they're doing? Or they getting treated right? Or they getting the services that they need? Then we're missing the gap with that. We're missing the gap with that. When you talk about parenting skills, <laughs> this is a story I often tell myself from time to time. I was pretty much raised by my mother. My daddy worked off shift. So she was everything in between. But her best job was she had to call the police. She was. <laughs> she took care of it every single day. And even though she's passed away, I thank her for that all. Because again, where would we be? She held me accountable. She made sure I understood right from wrong. She made sure I remained respectful. And those are the only small things that we're asking our parents to do when raising our kids. It goes back to Mr. Calvin saying, we're not, we're not here to be your friend. We're not here to hang out with you. We're here to guide you to have a productive life. All I ask my kids is that, you know what? If you leave you without attention, show me. Don't tell me, show me. I just want you to be a part of the community, be productive, and pay taxes like me. I just need, a, I'll tell them, I just need a little help. Pay some taxes for me. But again, a lot of kids face a lot of challenges. This world is totally different. Social media is harmful, but also can be helpful. Social media is uh, PlayStation or Sega Genesis or whatever they call it is not the babysitting service. Number one, <clears throat> programming. Programming can start at home. One hour, you spend one hour with your child. Just one hour. It goes, it goes a long way. You know what's going on. You know what's happening. Just one hour. Programming. Summer camps. Sheriff Sonia program is helping. But also, let's get back to what we started the program at. Let's get back to have those programs in our church. Bringing those kids in. That's, that's the component that we miss. I don't care if you, if you set up a program and one child comes. Guess what? You just affected one child Amen. and you saved one. The analogy I always use I can do this job for 30 years. If I save one child a year, that's 30. All of us sitting in here today could do the same thing. That grows exponentially. 30 years, 30 kids, 40 years, 40 kids. And let's look at the population of the parish alone. I got a 30, I have a 32 bed facility. 32 bed facility. If one person could change one kid's life per year for 30 years, all I need is 32 people from the community to take an active part in a juvenile's life. Think about that. An active part. Don't mean you got to spend all day with them. Just take an active part in a juvenile's life. So, for me, this is a passion. This is a cause. It's not just me standing up here speaking to you. It's my passion. 
to change as many lives as I can along the way. Um, someone just called me, up. I got an email and I got a call from a parent saying I'm having trouble with my 16 year old. Uh, he's out of control, he's keep getting in trouble in school. What do I do with him? First, I gotta sit down, I need to have a conversation with the parent, with the child, and see what exactly was going on. Because it may be something as simple as, you know what, you're doing everything you're supposed to do, keep doing what you're doing. It's one good thing that I understand about juveniles, they're very, very resilient. Yeah. When, you, when they're not paying attention, they are paying attention to everything that you do. And one of the things I convey to my staff is that make sure you conduct yourself professionally 100% of the time because your kids are watching. They're following your example. They're listening to what you're saying. Um, one of the programs that I have that comes into um, the facility is we have different different churches coming. <coughs> and one of the things I, I, I pride myself on, I say, no, I don't want you to put the kids up, whoever don't want to participate. Leave them out. Let them go sit on the side. Because sometimes when a kid is, you think is not listening, they are. So even the other group that's participating with the church, the other child might be listening. Something somebody said or something they, they did might capture that kid and bring him home. So I want to make sure that every opportunity is seized with our kids to make sure that they have uh, a possibility of success. Me and Mr. Carl was talking, and I thank Mr. Carl for inviting me here um, to be a part of this program because it's very, very vital to the community. Get ready to close this talk, sorry. <laughs> I told you I'm passionate. Um, it's key to all of us in the community to make sure we take care of the community, which is our kid. The two things I can encourage you to do. If you see something, say something. That's simple. If you see it, say something. Don't wait till something go wrong with you. You want everybody to say something. Do that. Number two is, I can't tell you how crime has increased amongst my juveniles when it comes, when it comes to gun charge. Okay? How they, how they hit these guns? is number one is, they're stealing. Most of them know what they're doing, they go into the car door, oh, it's over. Guess what they got in there? A gun. Second point is, lock your car doors every single time. Whether you run it in or whether you, <coughs> you don't remember, hit the lock. Technology, you can stand in the house and, and hit it. You don't have to run out there anymore. So, lock your car doors. Lock your car doors. I have open door policy. Most of I have open door policy to the community. Uh, I have a number that you can contact me at all hours of the day. I call it the back phone. It's 985 381 5742. That's my cell. 985 381 5742. My office number is 985 853 1201. Anything I can do to help. Anyone, when it comes to your, your, your juveniles, grandkids, or anyone, give me a call. Let's see what we can do. Sometimes you may be on the right track. On the right track, it's just you have to keep going and keep going and be a little patient. I like I like to thank everyone, the individuals who spoke before me. Thank you. And please, if you have any any concerns, any questions, anything you like, please ask. Please call. I'm happy to help out anyway. Something you want to say, Mr. Call? Yeah, I just want to um, ask uh, anyone who wants to entertain a question to in person. Yeah. So, was your comment on the COVID-19 threat? Did those incarcerated and how did that change what you're trying to do with that? Good question, Mr. Wayne. Um, COVID-19 has changed our landscape immensely. Um, we had to put some uh, protocols in place, and those protocols are presently in place uh, right now. Uh, that's why we're unable to have visitation, we're unable to have the churches come in. Uh, one of the protocols that we conduct is that uh, we take, make sure everybody has their temperature taken. 
and make sure we um, observe them for about um, five days to make sure that they are COVID free. Um, our protocols, um, as for accepting the kids, <laughs> if you commit a crime, whether you have COVID or not, we're going to accept you. We have the capability to separate you from everyone else in the facility. Each, each unit has its own single individual room. Then I escort you in, you will stay there, we'll monitor you. Uh, we have a nurse on duty as well. Uh, the nurse will be able to monitor you and take care of you in addition to that. So for the first five days, we're going to monitor you and make sure that you are taken care of. Uh, our numbers, even during COVID, um, pretty much stayed the same. Um, nothing really changed. Um, it did look, the numbers that um, compared to intake from year to year uh, did decrease. Um, but this past year, in 21, it increased a little bit. Um, we had increased that about 66 uh, kids we intake from the previous year. So um, COVID-19 COVID doesn't impact us when it comes to if an individual commits a crime. The only thing that it did impact us on, because sometimes we have to help our other surrounding communities, we was unable to take their kids in as we sometimes usually do. So that's the only impact that it occurred. Lady right here. Uh, thank you. My question is, the behavior modification programs that you say you have in your facility, yes, are they working to help them to deter the behavior that you're getting in your Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know how I operated without my um, behavior modification program. Uh, I can say this. It had, cut, it had decreased our numbers of reports that we write in the facility because of the behavior modification program. And if I give you a, a small example, um, our behavior modification program is we give this kids 131 points every Friday. Um, if you try to get a kid to work his way up to 131 points, that doesn't work for our juveniles because they already have a lot going on. They believe in having to have something tangible. So we give them 131 points and they have to keep those points. But if they commit an offense, we'll take those points for each uh, offense that they have. We have certain levels that they're on. We got platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. If you're on a platinum, you still get a choice of whatever you want to eat, or you still get a snack, or whatever. But our behavior modification, behavior modification program, more than anything else, is teaching them to be accountable for their actions. And I love the fact that you said accountable. So this brings me to youth counseling party. How do we get, because this is going to be a go back to camp, we have the program that we're having today is one step in trouble. We need to figure out how to stop them from getting there. Mm -hmm. So those programs that he's talking about that he's working within his facility, we need to find out how to get them, set them up, government assistance or whatever we need to stop our young people from getting there. Uh, we, we frequently uh, budget and make budget adjustments to the juvenile area. Uh, I have uh, two other colleagues here and uh, prevention is, is, and, and, and all of this is uh, part of the responsibility that I'm getting up with right now. Uh, we started off with government highway show was there in the beginning, and, and what stemmed out of that first uh, meeting that we had was the fact that uh, prevention. Uh, once we, go, we get the prevention, we, we, we deal with the system and, and such as the city marshal, we deal with the uh, uh, Mr. Joe. But when yeah. you talk about prevention, prevention is such a large, it's on a large scale. And it's, it, it, it's, it's part of the program. And we're working on that to get the programming before they get to us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give you an example. One of the things that just occurred and the laws just changed that now they want every child to go to Head Start. Yay. Yeah, they needed that. Yeah. It's not having the kids stay at home and then go to kindergarten but actually have them go to Head Start. And that's some of the things that, um, when you talk about programming that even on the state level that they're doing, when they say a kid has to, can or needs to go to Head Start, because they, they need that advantage to, or that Head Start to get started in school. That's some of the things that we're doing. As our government goes through the process of, of developing funding uh, to start those programs, they're, they're, they are coming. But at the same time, I'm gonna go back to my previous statement. As churches and communities, if you don't ask what, what you want, you don't get it. Requiring 
make it happen. Oh, um, every twice a month we have council meetings open to the public. <laughs> Come in, express yourself. Monday night and Wednesday night is available. Am I right? Yes. To speak. Second and fourth. Uh, weeks. Second and full week. Come in. Express yourself as being a part of the community. Nothing bad. It's for a good reason, good cause. That's why we take the opportunity to vote, to make a change, to voice our opinion. Excellent question. So you're uh, talking about my granddaughter. She came to your facility one time. And she said she don't want to never go back yeah. again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> but, but that's why we're here, Captain Joe, so that we relate this to you mm -hmm. and to you to go back to it, also related to your colleagues. You see, so so they can have an idea of how to help us out too. Yes. Some of some of us knock on that door a million times and we can't get in. So that's why we're here to, to tell these leaders, to tell each other one what we need and what's going to help us. Totally and that's true. why, which, just like the lady echo, what I said earlier, we need these programs before we get to that door. When they get to you, they don't get everything they need. But we don't want them to get to you. We don't want them to get to you. And, and that's, and that's, I don't want to cut your job out. I want you to be there. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're exactly right. And that's what I'm talking about. We've got to go back to the churches. We've got to go back to the community. We had, a, we had a program at Dumont Center. I don't know if it's the after school program. Let's get back to that. Um, me and Sheriff Sonia was talking about the, the program and about our kids. Me and uh, Mr. Weber had a conversation a good while back about those programs, uh, about the kids. We others, believe me, we're not just sitting here waiting for someone to do bad to get them into our system. Believe me, that's why we, Mr. Carl put this on for us to make sure we have that dialogue. Good dialogue, I mean, this is what we need. Because sometimes we have to be reminded of what we need to do uh, in, in, as public officials as well. So yes, we are doing that. But again, let's start from the community level and say, hey, look, let's go to our churches and say, hey, look, I think that we've got this program to get started, or we don't have no funding. OK, then let's go to the council meeting and say, hey, look, this is a program which, look, let, let's take the process that we have now you know, and start with that. You know, we have to start somewhere. I wish I could stand here and say, and, and wave the wand and say, here it is, but it's called, it's called a process. It's just the process that we take with our kids from day one, because they, they're not gonna listen to me if I tell them one or two, three times. I probably gotta tell them 20 times, don't do that, don't do this here, but guess what? At the end of the day, they finally get it. Yeah, I was the president here, that was the damn you. <laughs> yeah, um, um, I had the opportunity to speak um, uh, at this church, and, um, and you're right, um, Joe and I, we run into each other frequently because this is the reason why I brought a program such as this to you guys. That's something uh, that um, uh, the school board president uh, is, is in here too. We, we want to get Mr. Darren to say something also. But there are programs that we that are offered, and we have to be able to come to the council meeting. We have to hear the voices of the people. I uh, talk to the council person that's trying to do things such as I'm doing here. Um, but. Uh, it's a cycle, and everybody has to be involved. Many members in this community, but one body working together for a common cause, biblically, um, uh, sort of speaking. So it, it does involve the church, it does involve law enforcement, it does uh, involve uh, government. But most importantly, it involves you. Most importantly, it involves you. And, we look at uh, a program such as Accent. I think Accent is on Battle Street, right? That's a program that's actually being prevented, uh, prevent, uh, presented to people that have school aged children. But there's one catch to that. Number one, you got to recognize that your child has a problem before he gets to Mr. 
to the show. The second part about that, you got to sign your kid up to go there. You have to bring that kid there. There are some programs out there, but then there's some other factors where you look at these kids are victims of society, and society that they are a victim of are in their own homes. Yes, sir. Uh, for Mr. Joe, um, my name is Carl Tudor Beverly, and uh, I, I do pre preventive outreach, and uh, I go into facilities as well, prison outreach, and uh, to the juvenile detention center that I do in uh, in Harvey, called a Rebarred Detention Center. And um, we just started being able to go back in there. I've been doing it for years, and COVID put a strain on everything. And for the last couple of months, we've been going back in. And uh, you know, speaking to the kids, they use my uh, my story uh, from a, a testimonial standpoint. I've written a book uh, called Vision in the Wilderness, and uh, we we go in there. You just mentioned earlier that uh, that the visitors or the volunteers or the churches are unable to go in. Is there something set in place where at some point uh, they will be able to go back in to provide those uh, inspirational services for those kids? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, matter of fact, I just spoke with my team um, this week. Uh, we're supposed to be uh, getting a plan together to have those individuals come back in because I was speaking to uh, another association that was wanting to come in as well. So we are uh, planning for that, but I think the most important thing, we definitely need to have a conversation. Okay. 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 We have one more, and then, uh, of course, I'm on the here. We have. Uh, both issues, uh, Mr. Derek Adrian and Mr. Uh, Darren Adrian. Um, right now, Ms. Caroline Dan, and we talk about victims of society. Uh, Mr. Joe created a passionate approach and knowledgeable approach. Ms. Van Dam, you may want, uh, we all have some of these gentlemen come up here, you might get in line. Uh, but, She's gonna um, present us as you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol McNabb, and I'm the executive director of Lewis Children Crisis Center in Homa. We operate two of what we used to have three residential homes. Uh, for children who have been taken away from their parents and who are in the custody of the state of Louisiana. So we raise these children, they live with us, and uh, we try to prepare them for life, uh, hopefully with a foster family or an adoptive family. Um, and that, that's what I do. Now, so I'm gonna talk to you today about early intervention, but first of all, I'm gonna tell you I've spent six decades on this earth, and I have observed a lot and been fortunate enough to work with a lot of you people uh, in my professional career uh, with regard to children's advocacy. And I can tell you that the solution to the crime problem in Terrell Parish is in buildings like this with people like you. When faith-based community and law enforcement and the judicial system and community organizations come together to tackle the problem, that's where the power is. And so I'm, I'm very happy to see this effort and I thank all the organizers for putting this together because this is the answer, make no mistake about that. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to give props to the Sheriff's uh, Department for Carabone and uh, Chief Kay McCollum, who I think is left. Uh, we've had to call on them from time to time. Uh, the, the children who come to us come sometimes with some very extreme behaviors because they've been traumatized uh, sexually, physically, emotionally, uh, and they come from terrible backgrounds. And so, uh, as you know, trauma affects children's brains and it causes them to exhibit behaviors that seem very bizarre. Uh, and there have been times when we have had to call law enforcement to come out and assist us with children who what we call it wilding out, but they're they're acting out in extreme ways and we need assistance and I can tell you that the officers to the very last one have been not just professional but compassionate and um, we appreciate that so much and that's why we don't 
as they hesitate to call because we have faith in what you do and props to you guys for the training because it's evident in the way that they're able to handle the kids. So um, we thank you for that. Um, early intervention, I also want to uh, mention that I've worked for a long time with Joe Harris uh, back to the year 2000. And everything he said to you is true. That man is as fine a children's advocate in this parish as, as I have ever known. And yes, he runs a juvenile detention facility, but he cares about the children there. And he is vested in turning them out in, in a better way than when he got them. And you can believe him when he says that I've seen it with my own two eyes. Um, so what we've learned, uh, we've had a lot of psychiatric training and psychological training in trauma-induced behaviors in children. So if you can identify these behaviors and get these children help early enough, you can, in fact, change the traje trajectory of their lives. Um, I had a teacher um, tell me years ago that every third grade teacher can identify the at-risk children in their classroom. They, they know that young. So if we really want to uh, address all aspects of the crime problem in Terrebonne Parish, we need, we need to look to the children. Um, I, I used to do criminal defense work. I represented a 17-year-old accused of murder years ago. And I, got, and, and I had represented him as a juvenile. Um, and, uh, what, what, I, what I learned was just astounding, and it was that when this child was 10 years old, um, his mother was severely mentally ill. I don't think his dad was around. Uh, he was one of six or seven children. They lived in poverty. And when this child was 10 years old, he formed alliances with other children who sort of lived in the street. They would form alliances to find food and they would learn whose mother was home and had a pot of food on the stove, or whose grandmother had food on the stove, or where they could go and get a few hours of sleep where they were safe. And that's what, that's what early gang alliances start looking uh, like, that these children start relying on one another for things like food and safety and security. So, if you can identify these at-risk youth when they're 10 or 11 years old and give them some resources, that's where you can really make a dent in, the, in a pipeline into the criminal justice system. Because I mean, my job is keeping my kids away from Joe Harris. <laughs> but, uh, but that's where, that's where the real, that's where the real uh, yeah, evidence is in terms of, in terms of who putting resources on kids? The earlier the better. Early intervention, early intervention, early intervention. And that being said, I'm going to tell you a happy story because it, it just happened last week. But uh, I had a child a few years ago who was 12, and she was uh, held on wheels. And uh, the reason they sent her to us was because nobody else could do anything with her. She bounced around from foster family to foster family. She's fighting with other kids in school, wouldn't listen to the teachers, wouldn't go to school half the time. She was really headed in the wrong direction. And um, so we got her. And uh, I noticed two things about her right off the bat. She was 11, about to turn 12. And she was as tall as I am. So we weren't ever going to have physical domination over her of any kind. She was, she was a bitch. She was a, she was a tall kid. But I, I, I noticed two things about her right off the bat. One was that she had a wicked, smart sense of humor, and I came out as sex, but she was, but it was smart, and she was funny. And the second thing I noticed about her, you know, a basketball court at one of the homes, and my office window faces the basketball court, so I watched the kids play. I watched them playing basketball, and I used to be an athlete, so I recognize athletic talent when I see it. So I went outside and I said, um, you're pretty good at basketball. Do you, ever, do you ever play on the team? And she looked at me like I had two heads. She said, no. Um, 
she came from a terrible background. Uh, mother was severely mentally ill, drug addict. Her father was an alcoholic. She had six siblings. They'd all been in and out of jail and juvenile detention, and that's where she was at. So I guess that was a stupid question. I asked her if she had played on basketball teams. So she looked at me really strange. And I said, well, where'd you learn to play? And she said, in the street. And I said, you're really good. Would you, would you like to be on a basketball team? And, and she did respond. And I said, because we have a parish recreation program here. And um, they're having the, the girls' basketball teams get ready to start up. They're having sign-ups. Would you like to be on the team? And she said, yeah, I would. So, uh, look, this was luck. I, I, I wish I could remember the name of the coach whose team she was on. But he took that team to the championship that summer in that age division. So this young lady got to take a picture with a big gold medal on around her neck, holding the trophy. And it was the proudest I think she'd ever been of herself in her life. And it was, it was a little rocky because, you know, she, she, she took an attitude with her every now and then. You see, would yell at her while she was on the court, yelling instructions to her. And she walked off the court one time, and I went and got, because I went to all the games. I was the biggest cheerleader. So I went and got her, and I said, what, what are you doing? And, and she said, I, I don't have to listen to him yell at me. And I said, he's yelling at you because he sees the talent in you, and he wants you to be better. When he's yelling at you, He's telling you how to be better. He wants you to succeed. So she stayed on the team. Anyway, she ended up playing in the championship game. And then, um, you know, we, we had some ups and downs with her, but we started explaining to her how important it was for her to do well in school. Um, and and we, uh, we expected her to go to school. We expected her to do schoolwork and homework and projects and make good grades. Her grades started coming up. And the behavior started falling away. It, 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 it's not just look, it's not magic. It, it takes time. We have it for a year. So it took about a year. And then finally, we had some people interested in providing foster care for her. So she she almost ended up with um, an older sister, but that placement fell through. And then she almost ended up with another lady, and that fell through. So, which is typical of these kids' lives. They just, they, they just bounce sometimes from from person to person, but the difference was there were people expressing an interest in her now because she was developing a track record. And so, long story short, she ended up with a, a, a lady in Baton Rouge who uh, was her foster mother, who was also a girls basketball coach. And um, this past basketball season, that team won a championship in their division. And last week in Facebook, I saw a picture of her and the lady in court for the adoption. So she's been adopted. So that's a Thank you. Great story. It, but I'm telling you, when a child gets to be 12 or 13 years old, it's a long shot for a happy story like this. Um, and she's just lucky she landed with us. And I'm lucky she landed with that basketball coach. And, and she got a lot of lucky breaks. I, and God knows she deserved them because she didn't ever have any. But, but the point of all of this is um, you never know sometimes. It, it, it said our kids, most of our kids are never going back to a parent. So they're going to be dependent on somebody else to give them some kind of family life. Um, so you can in the community or in your church or in whatever organization you participate in, if you see a child struggling or you become aware of a child who's starting to have trouble, you can make a difference in that child's life. Sometimes it just takes one person to express an interest and to show that child that, that yes, there's something good about you. Yes, there's something special about you. Yes, somebody loves you. That makes a huge difference. And so that, that's why I was asked to come because I've seen this happen over and over with younger children. If you can put the right group around them or the right family around them or the right team around them, it, it's amazing what a difference it can make. So don't underestimate that. And the little Irish Catholic nun who started the program that I run right now, Sister Azaria, told me you can indeed save the world one child at a time. And that's what we should aspire to. And that's 
what I think everybody in this room is dedicated to, and that's what's going to make the ultimate difference. Thank you. That's another avenue uh, that we have and funding um, a lot of things. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. McNabb. Um, school board president, have the next set. Yeah, I just have to have my saying my saying. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Hoy. I'm Paul Hoy, a little bit from Virginia. Uh, my name is Greg Hoy, and I'm a school board president. There's a lot of great things that were said here today. I'm not going to be redundant or what was said, but I think I'm going to follow the footsteps of this but now, saying that education is the way to go. Before that, before children are born, before you see Mr. Joe Harris, before you see the sheriff or the DA, they see us. They see us in school. We all the way. We, 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 we wondering why, what can we do? But one of the biggest things that we do is education. If you go back and look at 80% or 90% of those kids that are incarcerated, the bulk of them do not have a form of education. That is one of the key areas that is important. What we are doing now is that we are partnership with a, with a wraparound company. And we're going to start going out and counseling kids at a young age. Because if a kid does not get between first and fourth grade, you can pretty much forget it. Between first and fourth grade. That's why it's very important for the ASR program. Our system, sometimes these kids come to school, that's all they're able to get. That's the only safety they get. You know, uh, we talk about TPR, we talk about coaches. You know, I, I'm involved with TPR recreation. And we have meetings, with coaches meetings. I tell the coach this. I say, a kid is not going, 10 years from now, is not going to remember how many games she won. He's going to remember what he learned or she learned. Team concept. Sometimes we can't reach our own children. It takes others to reach, reach them. Janitors, secretaries, this is anybody out there. And this is the last thing I want to say, and, and I think we need to hone in on this. You see, it just, say, it just takes one. It just take, save one person. But you never know what that one person is going to affect on life. You never know what that one person that you save is going to turn out to be. That person could be the president of the United States, the next best scientist. So you just never know that. So just don't take for granted just saving one. And, and, and in closing, you know, I'm going to say like the old minister normally would say, the harvest is plentiful. I say the harvest is plentiful to the labels of you. And you can look out here today and witness that the labels are few. The ones that need to hear what being said today are not here. We said it to the choir. So what we need to do, we need to go out there, out in the community, and let the community know what's going on. Again, Carl, thank you, man, for all your hard work. Uh, I hope you weren't embarrassed to see that I was your brother, but I'm your little big brother. You know what I'm saying? But uh, that's my brother car. I love him to death. And uh, thank you, man. Thank you. And may God bless everybody in here. Thank you. Thank you for coming to a close. Besides my colleagues, any other election officials um, that's here? Okay. Mr. Deere, would you like to say anything? Uh, Mr. Derrick, would you do this? Thank you. First of all, Pastor Brown, Pastor Clark, Carl, thank you for all working together in this. Um, you know, we're here is to, to solve a problem. And in order to solve a problem, we all have to work together. And that includes our law enforcement system, 
right from home to for you to be able to say, look, I am proud of my daddy. Look who my daddy is. We don't have that anymore. And it's time to start bringing it back. You know, it's all part of all our problems. All of our problems. We gave our kids too much. You know our kids were some? They wanted the Reeboks. I don't know what the fancy name for the shoes are today. But in my day, they wanted Shibochi. They wanted Reeboks. Mama gave it to them. Well, when I grew up, when you wanted that Reeboks on your jeans, you went out and you worked for it. The problem is, a lot of our kids today, look, go anywhere you want to tell them on parents. That's cell phone signs. Go out and get a job. Make it where you are, where you feel like you're making this, making yourself in this community. You're a great person, and it, it does things to you, you know? A lot of these homes, you know, now, we live on, we live on the government. We live on the system. No, we wasn't born to live on the system. We were born for this system when you were down to help you get back up and get back into the real world every day and fight. You got to fight every day of your life because there's somebody in this world that wants to lead you down the wrong path. You know what? And it should get starts at the home. The whole problem with our whole problem is just we crime, body crime. I mean, it's sad to see all these people shoot each other. But our problem started at home, guys. When you don't have a home for these kids, like Mr. McNabb, you know. She raises these kids, she sees these kids. Mr. Harris, she sees them after, they, after when you get a little bit older, but we all need to come together and take care of our, our children. You know, like the, the old Hillary Clinton campaign, it takes a village. It does take a village to raise up our kids. You know, the group of younger and uh, Aunt Susie down the road, or, or Miss Susan down the road said, she calls up and she says, Mom, I see Lil Durk doing this, you know what I mean? Well, guess what? Lil Durk did that, you know what I mean? No matter what. My mama did not say, well, no, he didn't do it, because an adult will be responsible people back then. And he didn't take up for everything our kids do. Mr. Harris, uh, uh, he, uh, Mr. Harden, that's in the school board. Y'all know that. When some kid bring, uh, messes up in school, moms are always coming down, they want to take up for that kids. You know, but you can't just keep taking, it's not the school, it's not the teacher that love me, the teacher that like me. There's a reason that you're not getting along with this teacher. And these kids are going into these classes, they can hurt no all kids. They're being disruptive. You know, and they're not letting my kid or Sergeant or, or, or a sheriff's kid learn something. They're holding all of our kids back. So, you know, I can go on, it, it means a lot to me because these kids are our future of terrible parish, you know? These kids are the next leaders of terrible parish. But we need to wake up, and we need to tell all of our daughters and sons, raise your kids right. Be there for them. Be there when it's time when they get on that school bus. Give them a stab and say, look, before you go outside and play, you go outside and look, you got homework you got to get done. And look, when the street lights come on, make sure you're in my house. Because we're going to sit down and we're going to sit down as a family and be all together. And we're going to discuss the problems. You know, we got people that go out and they celebrate, man. Little Susie just graduated. We're going to go out and we're going to celebrate. So you go, they all go to Applebee, they go somewhere, and there's 10 of them celebrating. You know how they're celebrating? Every eight of them, like this thing on that phone. They're not celebrating. No, they're just going out and public. But we need to get the families back together. And you know, this won't happen overnight where the sheriff can fix these problems or Mr. Harris can fix these problems. This is going to take 15 to 20 years of us keeping going, making sure our kids are fed, making sure we know where our kids are. This is something that we need to get done. And I cannot keep going forever about this because it's really something that really gets to our heart. I'm pretty normal people, guys. You know, we all need to come together. You know, and, and, and that, was, that was Rodney King saying, why can't this all get along? Mr. Hardy, thank you a lot for what y'all do, you know what I mean? Sheriff, thank you. Mr. Harris, thank you. Thank y'all for everybody that's in here because y'all are in charge of the future of Terrible Parish. Thank God, let's not let our kids go see Mr. Harris. Let's not let them go see Tim Sonia. Let's do what we can do and stand by the kids every day and teach them the right way of life. It's us, it's us all in this room. It's these moms and dads. We need to get this done. We need to, thank you. This is where I started, and I guess, um, let's see if this is working from here. Two more people I want to introduce.
with you. We'll see it private. When I got this position, before I got this position, I mean, I just kind of said, oh, I'm not much of a politician. I got a love for you. I don't deal with politics alone. He has to assist me throughout you know, two years or something that I had. I just said, look, man, I'm straightforward. I won't lie to you. I call this man to help me to get some of the people out. And every time I call for this man, I think he will walk with him. Call it Because he answers uh, the call and gets the job done for me. You know, man, he's been a great friend. And uh, all the time, you don't see him. And he's, he's around. All the time when he takes care of the problems, he takes care of the dirt problems. He takes care of a lot of people's problems here. And I would refuse to be left here because a lot of times he pushed me up front, but I didn't feel as if that I didn't feel like I could be here. Sometimes, sometimes my time, my gas, and my pocket don't equal my passion I have for my people. And I thank God for people like him to. Because it's truly the responsibility of every citizen, good or bad, to have it. We have to collectively work together. Appreciate everyone that participated in this program, and as always, I'm going to from the age of this house. experience for all of us. And I thank you in behalf of the Eagle Right Baptist Church and also Reverend Dr. Lewis Clark for coming here on today to give us such pertinent information as you have given us. Uh, this experience that we have had today will remain a part of us uh, for the rest of our lives. And we will not take it lightly, but we are going to try to put what you shared with us into being and also incorporate it in our lives and in the lives of our children. We are aware of the fact that we are not in this world alone. And I kept hearing that today, that all of us need each other. And I believe Mr. Harris put it the best way of all. If you see something, say something. And I think we have neglected that uh, throughout our days as black people. We zip up our lips, our lips when we see something. We need to stop that. And we need to start chattering about it just as we would a basketball game or something else. When we see something, we need to say something to the law enforcement. Otherwise, we are being permissive or we are doing what criminals want us to do by keeping our lips sealed. I advise every person present in here today, if you see something, say something. Tell the story about what you see and you will make this world a better world for all of us to live in today. As I conclude my remarks, there's food prepared for you in our dining area. We pray that you partake with us after the benedictory prayer. Would you stand now for the benediction? Would you bow your heads? God our Father, we are grateful for all that we have learned on today. We thank you for each person who played a role in it. We thank you for each sheriff and for each person on program today. 
And we ask, Lord, that you continue to open our eyes of awareness about the crime and other things which are going on in our communities. And God, let us be able to do something about it. We ask that you bless each individual who spoke to us today and that what they said to us will be put in our minds and our hearts and acted upon in our lives. Our God, we ask that you bless the food which has been prepared for the nourishment of our bodies. Bless those who prepared it, we pray. And then keep all of us in your care and watchfulness. Watch over and protect us as you've done during the past two years from the coronavirus pandemic. Now keep us as we go to our separate places of residence. It is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we offer this prayer. And for your glory we pray. Amen. Congratulations to all law enforcement and government as we are all trying to find the united way to get everybody together and on the same page. We appreciate that. We'll take a short break. We'll be back with more.